Now we're rolling. Chris Kessert says studies have shown that unprocessed red meat is not associated with increasing cancer risk and is not associated with increase in heart disease risk. So again, you can talk about these proposed mechanisms all day long, but if it's not showing up in actual events that are meaningful to people, then you might be missing something. Maybe red meat acts in certain ways that you might think would increase the risk of death, but maybe it does other things that reduce the risk of death, and that's why we can't just focus on mechanistic studies. We have to look at actual endpoints. What do you think of this statement? Well, Chris Kresser is a, a decent guy. I know him on a personal note. Uh, rather interestingly, on a recent episode of Joe Rogan Experience, he was asked the question, are you a nutrition expert? And he answered very quickly, no, I'm not. I just know how to read the medical literature. Um, so one has to question whether it's worth taking much of his comments more than just on face value. But in reality, um, both red meat and processed red meats have a wealth of mechanistic data. We can talk about saturated fat, the absence of fiber, the contribution to rises in TMAO, talk about antibiotics, pesticides, uh, hormones that are in the meats. Uh, we can talk about the grilling process and the transformation that makes them more carcinogenic. But the reality is there is plenty of clinical human data of nutrition science. Nutrition science isn't always beautiful. And we'll never have a 10,000 patient study or 5,008 hot dogs and 5,008 broccoli. So we have to rely on the epidemiology that exists. It was strong enough that in October 2015, the World Health Organization and its agency said processed red meat is not only associated with the risk of cancer, it directly causes colorectal cancer, and it was associated with other cancers like prostate and breast cancer. So I don't think there's any dispute. Uh, nobody's overturned that World Health Organization research project. There have been subsequent publications that have confirmed it and added to its strength. Um, the world agrees processed red meat is probably the lowest form of human food, uh, an option for either joy or starvation, but never to be um, promoted as having health benefits in other circumstances. And my platform always is, it should be the first food banned from hospital systems out of their compassion for their employees, their patients, their guests, not to serve them food proven to cause cancer. You're a cardiologist. Why don't more doctors and cardiologists talk about diet and its impact on our health? Why don't more med schools? Should people go to their doctor to get advice on diet or heart attack and stroke prevention? The system needs to be changed quickly and dramatically. When you talk about medical students, residents, and what are called fellows or more advanced trainees, much of the preparation is actually to get them ready to take board examinations because the program grades itself to some degree by the percentage that pass the national board exams. So until you get a significant number of nutrition questions and balanced and fair nutrition questions on board examinations, it's simply not gonna make a big uh, splash with the curriculum committee. Uh, in my own city of Detroit and the largest medical school in the United States, Wayne State University School of Medicine, where I serve as a clinical professor, it's been a real struggle. We can get access to medical students at lunchtime, sometimes evening programs. Very, very rarely have we been able to get their real face time during the mainstream curriculum because it's dedicated to the more pharmacologic and other approaches to disease and not really the root cause of nutrition. When you talk about grown-up physicians, not doctors in training, it's really a matter of exposure. Um, you know, they're humans. They might prefer to play tennis, golf, and read a novel. Um, they're probably not picking up Dr. David Katz's, you know, big Bible of nutrition and reading it for fun. And the other exposure are conferences that many doctors go to, whether they're out of town or hospital grand rounds or hospital morbidity, mortality. It is just a rare event to see a nutrition topic at such events. Sometimes they're sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry, so they're going to feature you know, a new drug that has a new indication. Um, and sometimes there are other topics, but it's going to be pretty rare to review the you know, experience with reversal of heart disease and nutrition. They're just not seeing it. So they're picking up USA Today, Wall Street Journal, People Magazine, Sports Illustrated, GQ, whatever it is. Uh, probably getting more nutrition exposure from that source than anywhere else, which we know is very clickbait. We know it's very industry funded. 
we know is very inaccurate. Um, so it just, when we make it a priority, students, residents, fellows, and staff, medical doctors will have much more exposure to credible nutrition information. And you know, we know it's a problem just walk in a doctor's dining room, look around at the food, and nine times out of 10, you'd say, there's not an, there's not an intelligent species on the planet based on what's being served there, like, you know, sausage, muffins, and, you know, egg, cheese, omelets, and such. Tell us the information that was published in 1959, showing that if you grew up in Japan, you have a cholesterol of 120, and you almost never see a heart attack. If you move to Hawaii, your cholesterol rises to 180, and your heart attack risk triples. You then move to Los Angeles, your cholesterol is now 210, and you have 10 times the heart attack risk that you had when you lived in Japan. Yeah, there's some really cool observational data. It's not perfect data. It's not the ultimate randomized data that leads us to believe that our genetic background matters, but our lifestyle, our community, our friends, our family, our surrounding has a bigger impact on our health uh, or our disease. And one of these is called the Niho-san study. Relatively new to me, I've heard of it. It gets credited to, in part, Dr. Ansel Keys, one of the major researchers over the decades looking at the epidemiology, why we get heart disease. And he basically had it set up that there were native Japanese residents who were evaluated for health, cholesterol, blood pressure. A good portion of the population moved to Honolulu. There were cultural changes, diet changes, community changes. They had assessments of their health. And then they ultimately uh, identified a group of the Japanese that had moved to San Francisco, why, why it's called Niho San, S-A-N for San Francisco. And it was a trend towards changes in diet, changes in stress, changes in sleep, changes in community, uh, exposure to different kinds of restaurants and foods and grocery markets. And the cholesterol just went up and up from Japan to Hawaii to San Francisco. And ultimately it takes a while, it takes at least 10 years, often 20, to see cancer and heart uh, events start to show up on the radar screen. But all that followed and it's pretty convincing data that um, you can, create a really healthy environment, something often referred to, let's create a blue zones in our community or a blue zone in our house. Um, and you can create an unhealthy environment, which is basically most of American culture. Uh, but it's, to me, really a great example to teach people, you know, no matter what mom, dad, brother, sister had, and you should be aware and pay attention to that, what you do today, breakfast, lunch, dinner, gym, sleep, smoking, is by far the most important decision. Is it true that the egg industry sponsored 92% of the egg study since 1990? There is a lot of money in the food industry, whether it's dairy, beef, pork, egg, and they have the ability to identify and fund researchers. Probably the best example that's been published by credible uh, scientists was that in 2008 in Mexico City, the dairy industry got together and they had an international conference in response to a pushback that there were now dairy alternatives. Probably in 2008, it was mainly soy milk, maybe rice milk. Now there's 15 different plant-based milks. And the dairy industry actually published their notes of that meeting. That's why we know about it. Uh, I think it's in the Nutrition Action Newsletter in 2014. But their published notes indicate that they were going to try and identify marketing strategies, sympathetic researchers, the ability to fund research to further prove the point in this case that dairy was healthy and to try and secure their uh, sales in the United States around the world. And then we got the got milk and the chocolate milk and all the ads and actually published studies. They found researchers who were willing to do uh, human research or database research and take funding. Of course, you're supposed to put it in the article that it was funded by industry. The egg industry now to get directly to your question is no different. They have the dollars, this national trade organization of egg producers. Uh, the cruelty of the egg industry is pretty well known out in the media. Um, the debate about healthy, unhealthy is you know, in the public mind. And they have really flooded the research magazines with researchers that, you know, whether they're uh, of high integrity or not, but uh, they're taking money from the egg industry, that statistic that the majority of the newly published studies on eggs have been funded by the egg industry is true. And it puts a bias uh, where now you have to question the integrity of the scientist. Otherwise, you would have naturally thought that was assumed to be fairly uh, high integrity. But uh, it's hard to go back to your 
uh, your industry funded research contact and say, our project was a failure. We can't support that eggs are healthy. If we publish this data, it's going to add to the very large data that eggs might contribute uh, in an otherwise healthy diet to a rise in cholesterol or a rise in heart disease. That's an awkward situation. So even though it, it may be that they strive hard to avoid conflict, you know you're not going to get too much funding for the next project if you come up with negative data. Yes, it's a dirty, dirty kind of situation. Do you recommend cholesterol-lowering drugs? You know, there's a big issue with atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, plaque in the arteries. Cholesterol is not the only cause, but cholesterol in the blood is a cause. It's a risk factor. There's others like smoking, of course, diabetes. Uh, there's no dispute anymore in the medical world, even in the plant medical world, even in the integrated medical world, that um, the vast majority of the data is that a high blood cholesterol, particularly LDL cholesterol, causes atherosclerosis. It's not the only cause, but causes atherosclerosis. And beginning in 1994 with a big project called the 4S study, it was shown that agents, in this case, it was a statin, simvastatin, the 4S study, not only lowered the blood cholesterol, but lowered the heart attack rate and actually lower all causes of death. Very convincing study in people who had already suffered one heart attack. Um, and so many other studies have taken that very high risk group, previous heart attack survivors, then looked at lower risk groups and ultimately at people who've never had a heart attack. And that gets a little tougher to find. But the bottom line is um, some people can uh, achieve a, a very optimal cholesterol with diet and fitness and stress management. And some people try very hard and they can't. Uh, and dependent on their gradient of risk, if they've had previous bypass heart attack, stroke, stents, they need a very low LDL cholesterol and they may need a medicine to get there. Um, I sometimes use natural vitamins to get there, but uh, it's still taking pills. It's not just plants. Um, if people are at a lower spectrum of risk, and you can judge that very easily by certain heart testing and artery testing, uh, then we should withhold a drug that isn't needed if you don't have a disease. Let's not treat you for it. But yes, these agents are always the first choice of a vast majority of doctors where I would rather they try lifestyle for three or six months in most situations and pull the drug out as the last resort. But we're not getting rid of them anytime soon. Tell us about the 2014 study by Harvard researcher Morgan Levine, where she looked at 6,000 people prospectively, where she concluded that if you were an animal protein eater, you had a three to 400% increase in cancer risk. Was this study an outlier or typical of the research you have read? Yeah, Morgan Levine is a very bright and well-respected scientist. Uh, she was working with Dr. Walter Longo at University of Southern California, and uh, about five years ago established her own lab at Harvard to do nutrition science. Um, the research project of 2014 was a database it was dietary records, follow-up, um, age of the subjects and all. It wasn't a randomized study. So what they observed then has to be tested in other settings. And is it consistent with the biochemistry we know and other uh, observations? But it was a rather striking finding that as they judge it, the higher the intake of animal protein, the higher the risk of developing uh, you know, cancer, heart disease, and all causes of death. Whereas the public probably looks at animal protein, which is in the form of a chicken or a burger or a steak or pork, uh, as a great muscle building healthy option. Her data and others uh, shook the world a bit and often is used as one piece of a very large um, you know, uh, database that you can argue limiting or eliminating animal products uh, is a very good choice and substituting plant-based proteins is very wise. You know, the biochemistry is pretty well known. Um, you know, a, a piece of chicken isn't just protein, it's also uh, saturated fats and other uh, subjects and compounds in that family. A little bit of carbohydrate in chicken, not much, but there is a little. Um, it's a very you know, complex situation, but we know that some of those amino acids can trigger certain pathways that lead to damage to cells, aging of cells, consistent with this observed rise in death. 
Uh, we certainly know the saturated fat in chicken uh, leads to as much of a rise in cholesterol as red meat. That's some studies done in the last 12 months by some respected cholesterol researchers, Dr. Ronald Krauss. So yeah, animal protein will lead on average with enough people over enough time to more diseases seen. And uh, it's a good foundation to cut it out now. Chris Kresser says many vegans have higher homocysteine levels. He says it poses greater risks of cardiovascular disease, but also dementia and Alzheimer's. Is this accurate and does it pose a health risk for vegans? Homocysteine is probably a word that most people aren't real familiar with unless they're in the medical field. It's one of the amino acids that can come from food or can be created in the body in a cycle called the methylation cycle. Uh, it's been looked at now for maybe 50 years as perhaps being very fundamental to developing atherosclerosis and other diseases. It's not really uh, widely recognized that it's a major health threat. There's a few instances where some uh, research studies, I'm thinking of one particularly in China, they showed that treating to lower the homocysteine reduced the stroke rate. But there have been other studies that have not been able to establish any benefit. And what do you mean by treating? And what's Chris Kresser's comment? It's because adequate vitamin B12 in the diet, or if taken as a supplement or injection, is one of the necessary vitamins to have a active methylation cycle and a low homocysteine level. If you are very B12 deficient, your homocysteine level may indeed rise. A folate or folic acid, another uh, unnatural form of that vitamin is also necessary. Vitamin B6 is necessary. Something called betaine, which comes from beets, is necessary. Uh, so this is a fundamental cycle in every cell in the body, heart, brain, liver, kidney. Um, and uh, the message here is only one. Uh, people eating strictly plant diets should strongly consider supplementing with vitamin B12. There are other databases that actually have indicated a B complex vitamin, which will have the B12, B6, and folate, um, actually maybe associated with less heart disease and longer life. That's from some research from Dr. David Jenkins in Toronto, happens to be a, a, a senior and vegan researcher, um, but he's not very a big proponent of vitamins, but he did find that B complex vitamins had value. So whether you take B12 alone or a B complex vitamin, homocysteine shouldn't be an issue. The bottom line is I've drawn 10,000 homocysteine levels on patients. It's a very inexpensive and simple test. If you're unsure of your status, ask your doctor to check your vitamin B12 blood level, ask them to check your vitamin uh, homocysteine blood level. You said the best done studies in the world say if you eat more saturated fat, your cholesterol goes up. More saturated fat, coronary heart disease goes up. How many studies have been done proving this? How many have been done proving the opposite? How strong is the evidence that this is true? And who's denying this and why? The connection between diet and heart disease and specifically types of fats and heart disease in the diet was a hypothesis. Um, it was proposed as far as I have read, uh, perhaps by Dr. Ansel Keys in 1953, uh, a publication in a lecture actually at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, not far from where we are. Uh, but it was a hypothesis. It had not been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, he got criticized, he got pushed back, and he did what scientists do. You go to the lab and you try and prove it. Now, there was a basis to suspect it. There were certain observations that populations that ate diets high in cheese and meats and fats, which would all be high in saturated fat, uh, might be related to more heart disease in populations, perhaps like Japanese, that might have a naturally more rice and vegetable diet, had a very low heart disease rate. So there was a foundation to go to the lab. But there have been hundreds of what are called metabolic ward studies, uh, where you put a person in a controlled environment, they can't leave, you feed them uh, a meal of your choice or meals. Sometimes people stay you know, 10 days, two weeks, they're paid volunteers. And a lot of them have been done that have certainly determined on average, there's actually a very strong correlation between the amount of saturated fat in your diet and your blood cholesterol level. There's in fact two equations. One's called the Hegestet equation and one's called the Keyes equation after Dr. Ansel Keyes, where there's uh, such a predictable relationship between the amount of saturated fat in your food on your plate 
and your blood cholesterol, you actually can plot it out into a very linear relationship. You see it in whole populations called the seven country study, the amount of saturated fat in the diet of that country on average or that city on average correlates not only with your blood cholesterol, but also with your risk of developing heart disease and dying of heart disease, but you can see it in individual people too. So uh, all major medical societies that have no ax to grind, they're just trying to be authentic and uh, reporting to the public health recommendations, 21 and 21 agree limiting or eliminating saturated fat from the diet is a goal. Some say less than 10% of all calories, some say less than 7%, less than 6%. Uh, the largest and most expensive cardiac research project in the history of at least the United States was just released in November 2019 called the Ischemia Study. Uh, it was go right to stents and bypass for your bad heart disease or try medication, lifestyle, and exercise for your bad heart disease. Their recommended dietary goal was saturated fat, less than 7% of calories. So it hasn't fallen off uh, the radar screen is an important endpoint. Uh, there's always noise, there's always pushback. There are people that are proponents of more meat, more cheese, whether they have funding conflicts or whether they just have it as their viewpoint or a way to sell books or online subscriptions or whatever. And you can take the data and you can massage it, so-called meta-analyses, and you can do certain corrections and you can leave studies out and put studies in. The most famous of these that created the confusion in the public from 2010 and 2014 were not original research. They were meta-analyses that questioned the connection. Uh, they were widely criticized for the uh, structure of the study, for things they left in, left out. Um, however, once the headline reaches the cover of Time magazine, Butter's Back, it doesn't matter if a hundred other scientists say that was junk science or poorly formed research studies, it's out there. So they made their point, they've left the world confused, but there is no confusion. You know, cut back on foods high in saturated fat, and with the exception of a couple plants, like eating the extracts of coconut and palm, being coconut oil and palm oil, if you want to cut it back on saturated fat, you're cutting back on animal foods. Have we been consuming animal products for two and a half million years? If we have, doesn't that mean it's a natural food for our bodies? You know, it's really remarkable being a physician for you know a well over 30 years, how adaptable the human species is to a whole variety of circumstances, of so food differences, fitness differences, climates, environment, stress, good sleep, bad sleep, working at night, working during the day. I mean, we are a flexible uh, creature. And, um, you know, you can feed a human many, many different diets and get us to our reproductive years and keep the species going. And they may not be optimal diets. They may, you know, uh, be diets that we would, we would look at and say, not perfect. What this whole conversation is about is really the post-reproductive years is the optimal diet for longevity, the optimal diet for avoiding diseases that come on from aging, such as type two diabetes, cancer, heart disease, dementia. You know, we're, we're looking beyond just getting to age 20, 25 and having the species perpetuate because there are many, many different options to get to that point. Although you always have to nowadays talk about the environmental impact of any diet you're talking about because we have a real struggle with keeping them planet clean and healthy. And as our numbers grow towards 10 billion, that's an issue at every state. Um, so is meat our natural food? Uh, you know, we're not aware of any large long-term populations that everybody took a vow not to eat any animal foods until about 1944 and the vegan movement being founded in Britain. Of course, there were examples of single individuals that have made a decision uh, like Pythagoras thousands of years ago. But it's only really been in the last 70 years that people have said, on an ethical basis, health basis, environmental basis, I will never put an animal product in my mouth. So it's a relatively new experiment. Um, it has easily led to the conclusion that animal foods are an option and they're not necessary for good health with a balanced rainbow whole food uh, diet. I've been eating only plants for over 40 years in my diet and uh, haven't fallen over uh, you know, with an illness uh, or a uh, mortal event yet. 
thank goodness, and I don't plan anytime soon. Um, so I, I think it's clickbait to raise the issue is meat a, a natural food of humans. Obviously, it can be eaten and it can provide nourishment. And in situations of poverty and starvation, all the rules go aside. You feed people or you try and scrounge for food any way in any uh, place you can. But in the United States of America, where way more people are overnourished and have access 24 7 basically to a wide variety of foods. Uh, we now have to make these decisions, and uh, I strongly support limit or eliminate is, I think, the best option, you know, meat from the diet. Author Chris Kresser said that they've done controlled feeding studies where they'd feed people two to four eggs a day, and those showed that in 75% of cases, it had zero impact on blood cholesterol levels, and for the other 25% of other people, that they've termed hyper-responders, dietary cholesterol does not modestly increase LDL cholesterol, but also increases HDL cholesterol and does not increase the risk of heart disease. This is why the guidelines were changed on dietary cholesterol as there is no evidence that consuming dietary cholesterol increases the risk of blood cholesterol in most people. And even when it does, there's no evidence that it increases the risk of the heart attack which is again why the dietary guidelines changed for saturated fat. Again, most of the studies that showed harm were short-term studies. These longer-term studies have shown that on average, saturated fat does not increase saturated fat levels in the blood, and all of the long-term studies they looked at, only one showed any association between saturated fat intake and cholesterol levels in the blood. What do you think of this statement? Well, there's a whole lot there, and uh, old Chris Kresser uh, just going off with a lot of inaccuracies. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about cholesterol and the USDA guidelines. They, uh, the USDA guidelines, which last came out 2015, 2016, continue to advise reducing saturated fat in the diet. Uh, as I said, 21 and 21 major world organizations with different agendas and different scientists agree completely, including the largest cardiac study, uh, the ischemia study agrees. There's no dispute. Public policy is based on decades of observations, uh, the Finland, East uh, North Karelia study and others that you limit saturated fat. And the best way to do that is diminish or exclude animal products. When you get to cholesterol, there's far less cholesterol in the diet than saturated fat from an average American diet. A hundred grams of cholesterol is about the size of one toothpick, whereas we might eat a mass of saturated fat in the diet uh, as, big as, a, uh, as big as a softball or more. So one egg has two to 300 milligrams, so you think about two or three toothpicks worth of cholesterol. It's not that much of the molecule. Um, it has been studied over and over, and uh, it is true. Some people are, they're called hyper absorbers. You change the diet to put more meat in the diet, more chicken, more pork, more egg yolk, you will see quickly a rise in the blood cholesterol. And if the blood cholesterol stays up high enough, there's no doubt if you have enough people, you're raising the risk of heart disease. But another group of people, you can increase the amount of cholesterol in the diet and not see much change in the, uh, in the blood cholesterol level. That's actually not that disputed. We know that. Um, again, going back to Dr. Ansel Keys, he concluded after decades of science research, the focus of most concern for heart disease is to reduce saturated fat in the diet. The Mediterranean diet, which he observed around Naples, Italy in 1951 and forward, and brought back in three books he wrote with his wife, Margaret, to the United States, very popular books, the Mediterranean diet was largely to avoid high saturated fat diets uh, by substituting olive oil in place of butter, for example. And uh, that is, from a public policy standpoint, an effective move. Um, the guidelines, however, about cholesterol in 2015 did not say it no longer is a nutrient of concern. Their actually exact words were eat as little cholesterol as possible. They used to say 300 milligrams, which is about the cholesterol content of one large egg. So they eliminated that exact numerical. You could actually say perhaps it's a more stringent guideline now. Eat as little cholesterol as possible. So zero is an option. And it's 
possible to eat only plants that have a zero cholesterol diet. We synthesize cholesterol. There's no need for the human body to take it in through the diet. Every cell in the body can make cholesterol. So there really isn't a need, and that's an important concept. And then just to circle back, um, the relationship between eggs and developing heart disease has been complex. Um, it's also in part what's being eaten with the eggs. Is it processed white flour bread? Uh, is it uh, heavily uh, fried in butter or uh, poor quality oils? Is it next to a piece of bacon and sausage, as would be very common? Is it in a sausage muffin with a slice of uh, cheese, high in saturated fat? So egg runs with some really bad actors uh, and all. And you're not going to find too many people that eat only eggs without anything else around it, like I just mentioned. Uh, bottom line, um, there's no data that a diet that contains egg yolks can stop or reverse heart disease, the number one killer of men and women. Uh, all diets that have looked at the ability to stop and reverse atherosclerosis have excluded egg yolk in the diet. So it's an unknown experiment that will be difficult to do. You're going to need to get a sizable number of people with heart disease, feed some egg yolk, feed some a diet without egg yolk, and actually measure directly their risk of heart attack or death and measure their atherosclerosis. That hasn't been done. Um, I would always advise my patients and I would advise the public. Given the results of every trial on heart disease that directly showed it is a reversible and serious problem, and the fact that they all excluded egg yolk, and the fact that the USDA says eat as little cholesterol as possible, it would be wise to not eat egg yolk and not take in that source of cholesterol. And then always, how do we produce eggs? It's one of the cruelest, most environmental damaging systems of food supply in the United States, so uh, in terms of water, soil, uh, air quality. And uh, that's enough of a reason to say, I'm not gonna put a food on my plate that came out of the tortured life of billions of chickens. It's, it's just abysmal. Chris Kresser said, we have a meta-analysis of observational studies, including 350,000 participants that found no relationship between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular disease. The review of 25 randomized controlled trials and 40 observational studies of 650,000 people concluded that replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat doesn't lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. What do you think of this statement? Whether it was directly linked to this um, meeting of dairy uh, ex executives in 2008 in Mexico City or not, within a year and a half of that meeting where the stated purpose in published notes was to identify researchers that were sympathetic to doing research or publications that led the public to believe that foods higher in saturated fat of animal origin, like dairy, were actually good for them. Lo and behold, 2010, a paper was published by the lead author, Patty Siri Torino. Siri Torino is her last name and a few others ending in a Dr. Ronald Krauss, MD from Berkeley, California. Uh, and it was not original science. It was what's called a meta-analysis, put together a lot of previously published studies, had criteria which studies made it in, which studies didn't, um, and purported to show they couldn't reproduce in this meta-analysis that diets higher in saturated fat were linked to higher rates of heart disease. That paper really created a stir. Maybe we had it all wrong. Maybe research going back to the 1950s. Maybe Dr. Ansel Keys had it all wrong. Maybe the Seven Countries study had it all wrong. Maybe the Adventist Health Group had it all wrong. Maybe the uh, Finland experience called North Karelia studies had it all wrong. Oh, a lot of data. All these uh, metabolic ward studies that showed that saturated fat in controlled setting will raise blood cholesterol. Maybe that was all wrong. I mean, there was really no reason to a question all that research, but it did because it was a noisy study and made headlines. What's interesting, the journal that published it um, allowed a very prominent epidemiologist named Jeremiah Stamler, who just celebrated his 100th birthday recently, so he's cooking along pretty well, to publish a critique of that article in the same journal, which is really rare. Usually an article gets published, and a few months later there's letters to the editor, uh, pointing out something about the study, criticizing the study. This was in the exact same journal. So you could read the article and you could read a response that basically point by point by point 
um, indicated why it was a flawed study. So it had the opportunity to just shut it down right then, but it didn't. It created a group of book writers and online experts and lecturers and other scientists uh, that now had a platform different than the plant-based platform to promote what they either believed in or felt they could profit from, which was a meat heavy, dairy heavy, cheese heavy diet. Um, that was followed up in 2014 by another researcher named Chowdhury, uh, who did a similar analysis, a meta-analysis, not original science, didn't put one human in one metabolic ward and fed them one meal. They just looked at a bunch of papers. That uh, paper also purported to question using similar studies, but a different criteria that the connection between diets higher in saturated fat was not as closely linked to heart disease as we were led to believe. That also was of such poor quality that many people asked the journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine, to retract the study. They thought it was uh, you know, seriously detrimental to the honesty and integrity of the scientific literature. <clears throat> it never did get retracted, but it created a stir. And that's really it. I mean, there may be one other um, study in 2015, but it's not original science. It just has given sort of the pseudo-academic world, the book, The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholz in 2014, just enough ammunition to lead the public to be confused. And we know when they're confused and there's a cheeseburger and there's edamame, they're probably going to pick the cheeseburger because they read in Time magazine that the scientists have changed the rules. Uh, when indeed nothing changed, we actually know the best diet for the human species is a largely plant-based diet that's largely low in saturated fat and naturally low in cholesterol. What is TMAO? What do we need to know about it? What food is it found in? TMAO, four letters, T-M-A-O, stands for a molecule trimethylamine and oxide that until nine years ago, very few physicians and the public had never heard of. A couple of scientists did. There's a few decades of research on why fish can float at deep pressure in the ocean, why they aren't crushed. And there was a molecule in the flesh or blood of fish, TMAO, that provided some buoyancy. What the heck does that matter? Because about um, nine years ago in Cleveland, a research group asked the question beyond diabetes and blood cholesterol and smoking, maybe there's other molecules in the blood that promote atherosclerosis or damaged arteries. They had a reason to screen through a few hundred or a thousand potential candidates. And on the final list was three, but TML was one of the three. They went to the lab, they had a hypothesis, how science occurs. Uh, they actually drew blood on over 4,000 heart patients at the Cleveland Clinic. They were going through a procedure. They were able to measure TMAO. They had developed a assay for it. And they found a pretty strong correlation. The more plaque in your heart arteries on catheterization, the higher your blood level of TMAO. So they decided we're gonna focus a research group on this molecule. They developed as uh, soon after a commercially available assay that uh, physicians could order it. I actually think I was the first physician in the United States, maybe the world, to have access to this assay and have drawn thousands and thousands and thousands of blood levels in various patients of TMAO. But what we learned real succinctly is, how does your blood level get high? Uh, the quickest route is to eat red meat, which is rich in an amino acid called L-carnitine, or to eat egg yolk, which is rich in a nutrient called choline, when they get in the GI tract, there are bacteria that can convert L-carnitine and choline through uh, an enzyme reaction to something called TMA, trimethylamine. It smells like fish, but your liver has one more step. It's called FMO, flavin monooxidase, that will take TMA and make it TMAO, and then it's in the blood. Um, if you don't eat red meat and you don't eat egg yolk, you shouldn't have TMAO in your blood, except there are people that buy vitamins that have L-carnitine. Some energy drinks have L-carnitine, the popular ones. And there are vitamins that have choline. So I have many patients with very high levels, but they are actually plant eaters, but they've been taking vitamins that uh, somebody gave to them or they read about, uh, or they're drinking too many energy drinks. And as soon as we stop that, the blood level goes down. Uh, furthermore, there've been some very interesting studies at the Cleveland Clinic that if you do choose a plant diet and you're not taking these vitamins, 
you're going to have a very low or undetectable level of TMAO, um, which may be, you know, an unrecognized advantage of a plant diet is that one more factor in heart disease beyond blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, uh, inflammation is reduced with a plant diet. Um, being uh, the entrepreneurs that these scientists are, uh, their platform hasn't been very strong. Well, therefore, everybody should eat a largely or completely plant diet because that way we'd have lower TMAO levels and potentially over the years less heart disease. They're looking to create a molecule that blocks this whole process so you can literally eat what you want to eat and still have a low TMAO level because that potentially could be patented and become either an over-the-counter or a pharmaceutical agent that makes a whole lot of money. Um, they're on that trail. There was a publication in the last few weeks uh, that they may be close to it, and uh, it was animal testing, now soon to be human testing. Um, the molecule they're using, I believe it's called DMB, dimethylbutane. It actually is, to some degree, in balsamic vinegar, and it might be a good thing to put a little balsamic vinegar on your spinach or your kale. It's delicious anyways. But if you're eating a plant diet, it doesn't really matter. There should be no way you have to worry about TMAO unless you look at your vitamin bottles and there is L-carnitine or choline. But it's really been a big scientific breakthrough. Just to finish up, the only other pushback, because of course, if you're a meat proponent or an egg proponent and now you've got TMAO in the mix, you've got another reason that uh, people are avoiding eating these foods if you're promoting them. As I mentioned right at the beginning, there are a few species of fish that have TMAO in their flesh. And it's been thrown up as the argument, we all recognize fish are much healthier for heart disease than other animal groups. If fish have TMAO, it must be that it's all a non-issue, that uh, TMAO is uh, not a factor because fish are so great. Well, in reality, one, there's only a few species of fish that have TMAO, it is these deep water fish that have it for buoyancy reasons. It's not factory farm fish. It's not the little perch you caught in your local lake. Uh, it's you know deep, deep, deep water fish, usually ocean fish. Number two, it isn't necessarily accepted by all sources that fish are actually healthy, let alone the current concern of all the contaminants from mercury to uh, uh, PCBs, DDT, PFAS, and the rest, all these chemical soup that accumulate in fish flesh and fish fat. Um, there are animal studies where you take an animal and you look at its aorta, fed a standard chow, fed a chow enriched with fish. There's actually more atherosclerosis in the fish enriched chow than the standard chow. Uh, we need more science. I don't accept the fact that we would conclude that fish are a healthy food choice. It's always compared to what? I mean, compared to fried chicken and French fries, you know, a grilled piece of salmon may be a better choice and it fits better in the Mediterranean diet. But the best choice still might be a fermented tempeh, you know, patty and a stir fry uh, as even being a better choice overall. You mentioned that the Cochrane database said that your choice of butter, eggs, meat, and cheese absolutely predicted your risk of developing a heart attack and stroke. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, there, there is a group, and I believe they're in England, called the Cochrane Database. And they will take a topic and they will do a deep dive, uh, and then they will publish the data in a medical journal. And they have looked at the topic of the connection between the percentage of saturated fat in the diet and the risk of developing clogged arteries, particularly heart disease. And they have concluded, again, they're going to do a meta-analysis. They don't do original research. They don't take one person and feed them one meal and measure one blood test. They look at previously published studies and they have their criteria for which studies get in and which studies aren't of quality or topic to stay in. Um, and they've concluded that there is a connection. I think 2016 was the last time they looked at it between percentage of saturated fat and the development of heart disease. Um, there's a lot of flaws in the study. Their data wasn't overwhelmingly strong. Um, it didn't consider some of these metabolic ward studies where there was this very predictable rise in blood cholesterol from diets that are increasingly high in saturated fat. But, um, you know, they looked at the epidemiology and concluded, yes, we should be concerned. We should have a goal of eating foods lower in saturated fat, which are plants, with the exception of 
coconut oil and palm oil, which aren't really foods, are extracted oils. Do vegans have to be especially careful to get enough vitamin D, DHA, EPA, iodine, taurine, vanadium, chromium, and omega-3s? Is there any risk in getting all of these from supplements as opposed to from food? In view of the fact that the choice to eat plant-only diets is becoming popular really in the last couple of decades, and you can say the vegan movement was founded in 1944, so maybe 70 years, of which there wasn't science done during all those years. It's legitimate to ask the question, despite case studies like myself, who've been eating plant diets for over 40 years and uh, appear to have excellent health. It's legitimate to ask the question of any diet, of any diet, from Mediterranean to DASH to American Standard Diet, what is the nutrient content of that diet? And what is the vitamin supply and does it match recommended you know, levels that are out there? So the one that we talk about is B12 all the time, but yes, the list can be a little longer. There are isolated studies that have measured nutrients in different populations, meat eaters, plant eaters, suggesting that on average, there may be uh, lower levels of omega-3 fatty acids like EPA and DHA. There may be lower levels of vitamin D. Uh, there may be some of these uh, trace amino acids like taurine and uh, minerals like vanadium that most people aren't even familiar with. Uh, there certainly is the good news. It's never stresses much more fiber, much more vitamin C, much more magnesium, uh, much lower saturated fat. That's all the good news. It's unknown. Um, all these things can be measured in patients. They rarely are. You can certainly easily measure your vitamin D and your B12 level. It's actually very easy and routine to measure your omega-3 blood level. I do it uh, on patients thousands and thousands of times. Um, vanadium and taurine and some of the others are available. They're a little more specialty labs. It might cost a little bit more. So it's unknown. Um, one of the things that the industry has provided, I know of three or four vitamins out there right now that are multivitamins for vegans. Um, that have put these nutrients into a capsule or a tablet to provide them to vegans if they want to. Um, none of them, to my knowledge, have studied uh, and have proven a health outcome. That takes a lot of dollars, and usually these are small companies that don't have that kind of financial capacity, and it would be a big study and take a long time. So it's a personal decision. Um, I'm eating only plants. I don't want to take even a slight risk that I'm missing some trace nutrients, and I'm going to take one of these available vitamin um, options, or I'm a little bit more stricter in my approach, and other than B12, I don't think the data is overwhelming at this point. You know, the absence of studies and the absence of data doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. Uh, it's just at the present time, we don't have a one-year follow-up study, um, you know, with some endpoint with a more complete vegan supplementation or maybe just B12 supplementation. There is no data, so you can basically you know, choose what you wanna do. Chris Kresser said there's about eight major studies that compared lifespan in vegetarians and vegans and omnivores. He claims these studies had flaws and don't show proof that vegetarians and vegans have longer lifespans than omnivores. He also said two meta-analyses were done that found no difference between vegetarians and omnivores in total lifespan. What do you think about all this? Yep. The question, do vegans live longer, is really impossible to answer. In part, the movement isn't all that old. I mean, there were not many people eating an all-plant diet 25, 30 years ago. And even in 2020, there aren't that many people eating an all-plant diet they're not being tracked in a database routinely, and it's gonna take decades to really make an assessment. So um, it's a flawed question. Therefore, the data that's out there itself is somewhat flawed. We do have little pieces of data, or at least uh, some uh, published you know, research. The Adventist Health Study, many people have heard of that out of Loma Linda. That all started with the observation that the average lifespan in Loma Linda in the 1950s was perhaps a decade longer than the average lifespan in the rest of California. And an average decade of life is a huge advantage. And that prompted the question, why? And 
it became apparent that about half of the people in Loma Linda followed the Adventist guideline of eating a largely or exclusively plant diet and half ate a typical California omnivore diet, but that was a much higher percentage than the rest of California. There are other differences in their alcohol and smoking and fitness and such, but nutrition was felt to be the biggest difference. And in the Loma Linda published research studies, it appears that there may be a better lifespan amongst those uh, that follow the plant diets of the Adventist church. Um, I, I find it a tiresome argument because truly uh, we don't have the scientific capacity to really know it for sure. On a biochemical level, the, um, the pathways that cause aging and the diseases related to aging like cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and heart disease are activated much more by animal foods and plant foods, talking the big three ones called sirtuins. Uh, it's a pathway of aging. And what is the group that activates it for health? They're grapes and peanuts, polyphenols like resveratrol. There's a pathway called AMP kinase, believed to be very important in aging and disease. And um, the natural substances that activate it are citrus fruits and not meats. And then there's finally the pathway called mTOR, which may be involved in aging and disease process and cancer and Alzheimer's. And um, you activate it by meat foods, not by animal foods. Uh, sorry, not by plant foods. So from a scientific level, people that eat good quality whole plant diets should be uh, at the option of living longer than people that are eating meat heavy diets. But you know, a super clean meat heavy diet with some greens versus a super clean whole food plant diet has never been compared head to head. We're not going to have mortality data. It's sort of a, a topic we should move on beyond. Uh, and if you feel good and you're not on medication and you're productive, uh, stick with your diet. And uh, if you care about the environment, stick with a plant diet. Um, you know, there are a group of researchers, it's very interesting, like Dr. Ansel Keys, who followed the Mediterranean diet for about 60 years of his life. He lived over age 100. There's this famous researcher, Jeremiah Stamler. He was part of that group. He just celebrated his 100th birthday. There's a famous researcher from that group called Henry Blackburn in Minneapolis. He's approaching his 95th birthday playing his clarinet. I mean, it's an interesting observation that some of these scientists that studied the Mediterranean diet beginning in 1950s and adopted it have had exceptional longevity. But you can't base your decision solely on that because somebody that ate bacon and smoked cigarettes is going to live over 100 too. So you got to just take the whole large panorama of data including environmental data and animal rights issues, and uh, it all favors plant diets. In the year 2000, the World Health Organization, after looking at 800 papers with 22 world experts, reported an 18% increase in cancer risk from eating processed red meat. Tell us more about this. Yeah, the, at least I was stunned. Maybe the world was stunned. It was actually October 2015 when there were articles published in the British Journal called The Lancet by the World Health Organization and one of its cancer agencies, International Agency for Cancer Research. And they published that they had been um, going through all the world's literature. They had 800 research papers. They had 20 or 22 scientists that seemed to be without conflict. Now that's almost five years ago and there has not been any real allegations that the scientists that went through this research had financial or other biased conflicts, which is always refreshing. And they concluded that um, it's not only that the intake of processed red meat, the bacon, salami, hot dog, pepperonis, were associated with a high risk of cancer of the rectum and the colon, but that they actually caused it. They thought there was enough science, basic science, human science, um, petri dish science to say, when you eat a hot dog, you are increasing your risk of getting cancer directly. It's, uh, it's, it's a clear data. Then you have to look at how big is the risk and how does that compare to other lifestyle habits. And they came up with this overall uh, statistic that relative risk uh, was 18% higher. I think the best way to understand that is other data looking at the risk of living in a home with secondhand smoke or working in a situation where there's secondhand smoke raises your risk of lung cancer by a relative value of 18%. So um, smoking two packs a day is more risk to your health than eating bacon and hot dogs, but uh, it's on par with the secondhand smoke issue. 
Um, since October 2015, uh, these studies have not been retracted. They've not been found to be flawed. Um, the research group has published at least one follow-up paper I'm aware of in 2016 that confirmed and extended these observations. So the public response should be reduce or eliminate, for sure, processed red meat. You know, they also found that red meat in general was associated with cancer of a variety of kinds, breast cancer, pancreatic, ovary, and colorectal, but they did not come down with the stronger statement that red meat, the unprocessed red meat, like perhaps a steak, was a direct cause of colorectal cancer. Um, so we really should be focusing for public health and public education. And it's not a vegan issue. It's a medical health issue of teaching the avoidance of these foods, bacon, pepperoni, hot dog, salami, corned beef. Uh, as I've said, and I will continue to say, the obligation is for hospitals to take the lead. Hospitals should ban hot dog, pepperoni, salami, and bologna from their menus because it causes cancer. And they should not be serving foods that have been determined by a high-level scientific community uh, panel uh, that cause cancer to their patients, to their employees, to the guests. They should educate the public and the employees and the patients that we don't serve bacon and we don't serve hot dogs and we don't serve pepperoni pizzas and such because we care about you and they cause cancer and we're not pro-cancer. But I don't know of a hospital in the United States who's had the cojones to take a stand and ban these foods. So it's time and uh, everybody should uh, speak up about it and write to hospital executives because they're the ones, it's all a money issue. They're the ones that have got to change the policy. Chris Kresser said that we have lots of meta-analyses, but one of the best-known meta-analyses published in the journal Obesity Reviews was of 17 randomized controlled trials of low-carb diets that were in high, in high saturated fats, and they found that low-carb diets neither increase nor decrease LDL cholesterol. But what they did find was that low-carb diets were associated with decreasing body weight improvements in several cardiovascular risks, risk factors, including triglycerides, fasting glucose, blood pressure, body mass index, abdominal circumference, plasma insulin, C-reactive protein, as well as an increase in HDL cholesterol. Now, there have been now been 10 meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials looking at low-carb diets for weight loss. All 10 showed that the low-carb diet either outperformed in most cases or was at the same level as low-fat diets. There have been several meta-analyses that have looked at low-carb diets for diabetes and even cardiovascular risk markers, and all of these meta-analyses have found that low-carb diets are superior for glycemic control, for reducing insulin, for reducing triglycerides, and have beneficial effects across the board without increasing body cardiovascular risk markers. What do you think of this statement? Um, Chris Kresser is way off base. Um, there have been a, a number of studies that have looked at diets that could be characterized as low carbohydrate diets. If it's low in carbohydrate, it has to be either high in fat, high in protein, or high in both. Um, you have to look at this whole spectrum of Biochemical data is a high fat, high protein diet healthy. In fact, Dr. Walter Longo at the Keck School of Medicine and University of Southern California has said a high protein, high fat animal diet is the most dangerous of diets because that is the bulk of the data, whether biochemistry, there are no um, low carb centenarian long term communities that you can look at and say, boy, it worked out great for them and we should model ourselves after them. It simply doesn't exist. Uh, what he's focusing on is a couple what you call biomarkers. You, if you eat a low-carb diet very often, you're also dropping the number of calories you're eating in a day, possibly. Uh, the quality can vary from very good to very bad in these diets. Um, but um, biomarkers, blood sugar levels, blood cholesterol levels, what we care about even more is heart disease and survival. And there are, in fact, also 10 meta-analyses, not written by vegan proponents, just by scientists, that diets that are characterized as low carb compared to diets that are of a more mixed variety, like people usually eat, with um, hopefully complex carbohydrates like beans and peas and lentils and whole grains, are actually associated with 
excess death rates. Low-carb diets, excess death rates, something I've called the low-carb, high-coffin diet. That should cause people to be concerned. It's in the scientific literature. The uh, largest one I know of is in 2010, Dr. Noto, N-O-T-O, and had about a quarter million people in that single study. And there's one from Greece and one from Sweden, from the United States. Uh, it's been an international observation that if you characterize people's diet as low carb and follow them, their death rate is high. Um, concerning, concern, and there's reason to believe that could be accurate because of the excess animal protein, animal fats. Um, so at the present time, I think it's very irresponsible for medical people or health professionals to recommend a long-term low-carb diet uh, that in exchange is jacking up animal fats or animal protein foods like meats and butters and cheeses and dairy. Um, just to be complete, there is a plant version of the low-carb diet. It is possible to take a plateful of arugula, put some tofu, some walnuts, some lupini beans, cover it with some extra virgin olive oil. The you know net carb content is very low. The percentage of calories from fat could be 80 or 90%. Um, and there are people who have tried it. I'm one of them for a week or two. A couple other doctors I know, uh, one physician I know does it regularly to help control her type one diabetes. She's extremely well-schooled and is very carefully watching her arteries and all. It's not an experiment without uh, careful consideration of the downside. But there's really no model for vegan, keto, vegan, low carb either. It's just it can be done. And really, that's an experiment too that I never advise to my heart patients. The only diet shown to halt and reverse cardiovascular disease, number one killer in men and women, also shown to uh, have an impact favorably on prostate cancer and Ornish studies, is a diet that's high in carbohydrates from whole sources, beans, peas, lentils, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and naturally low in fat. And that's the model we should recommend to people. You said, I've been inside the heart 15,000 times and I've never scooped sugar out of a blocked artery. I scoop cholesterol out of blocked arteries. Please explain that. There's been a debate, food wars. They're popular, they're on TV. I participated in way too many of them. Um, but food wars aren't new. Uh, and at least they go back for sure to the 1960s when there was a debate about the cause of atherosclerosis. Was it predominantly foods rich in saturated fats? That would be Ansel Key's position, later the American Heart Association position, and now almost every major medical society's position if they have a voice on the topic. Or was atherosclerosis largely caused by excess sugar in the diet? And this has recycled from the 60s and 70s to the current day because of the uh, obsession with low carb diets. If you eliminate sugar from the diet, you're protecting your heart. In reality, this food war of the 1960s and 1970s is often characterized as Dr. Ansel Keys versus a physician in England, John Yudkin, who wrote a book about sugar and heart disease. Um, you know, the constitution of plaque in my involvement as a interventional cardiologist Having been inside arteries, there is a device that lets you take the plaque out, examine it, send it to pathology. There is no sugar crystals that are in your arteries that are causing blockage. There are cholesterol crystals that are in your arteries that can trigger a heart attack and cause blockage. There's no doubt about that. So there's no sugar in your arteries. Is sugar a healthy food in excess? Added sugar particularly, not fruit, but we're talking added sugar in cookies, cakes, uh, baked goods, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages? No, it's absolutely not. And with the rise in weight and obesity in the Western world, uh, which is due at least in part due to excess sugar calories and sugar-sweetened beverages and baked goods and such, um, sugar is a cause of heart disease indirectly. Sugar is excess calories, is weight gain, is insulin resistance, is type 2 diabetes, is triglyceride elevations, maybe blood pressure elevations, uh, sedentary lifestyle, and you develop atherosclerosis. So a public policy goal is to teach people to limit added sugar. Drink water, not sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, have an apple, not a donut. These are important messages that don't relate necessarily completely to saturated fat conversation. Sugar matters without a doubt in the diet that many Americans eat in 2020 and in the Western world. But does sugar directly, do you have any animal model you give excess sugar and within a short time they develop atherosclerosis? No. Do we have animal models? You give excess 
foods rich in saturated fat and cholesterol and they develop atherosclerosis. We absolutely do. We've had that for about 90 plus years. So the debate doesn't need to really be uh, discussed anymore. Both matter, but one directly causes the disease. In chapter seven of the plant-based solution, what did you mean by grow plants, not cancer cells? Yeah. Um, the plant-based solution is uh, the fifth book uh, that I published. And it was an overview of predominantly the relationship between diet and cardiovascular disease, but we did uh, get to other organ systems and conditions like cancer. Uh, and grow plants, not cancer, is uh, an area we still need lots more science. But the general feeling from epidemiology studies, basic biochemistry, centenarian studies, the richer your diet is in brightly colored whole plant foods and the lower your diet or absence of animal foods, uh, the lower is your risk of cancer. We have the processed red meat colon cancer causation data from the World Health Organization. We have databases that suggest that plant diets, observations like Japan where plant diets were very common and low cancer risk uh, have been observed. We have direct data from Dr. Dean Ornish on prostate cancer and putting men on plant diets versus standard diets and seeing a reduction in the size and uh, the markers of prostate cancer. Um, but we're not at a point where we can say, you have a bowl of salad, you'll never get cancer. You know, there's genetic factors, very strong environmental factors from contaminants, pollution and such. Um, I advise my patients, even if they're on a very uh, observant plant diet to still have breast imaging, colonoscopy or Cologuard, prostate examinations and blood tests. It's not a guarantee. It's just uh, increasing the odds you'll live a life free of cancer. In the 1950s, why were there 10 times more people in Loma Linda, California, who lived to over 100 than there were in Los Angeles? Yeah, the, the really important observation in the 1950s that Loma Linda was this interesting pocket of longevity with people living 10 years longer than the average Californian. You know, it triggered uh, funding from the government called the Adventist Health Study because it wasn't apparent completely why. I mean, it was certainly observed that there was a large pocket of Seventh-day Adventists and a faith-based recommendation that they limit animal products, they have some fitness, they avoid smoking and alcohol. But the research group really dug in and they got access to about 25,000 residents of Loma Linda. A second phase of the study got access to about 92,000 residents of Loma Linda. They got blood work, they got dietary histories, they got lifestyle factors, and they repeated them over time and they followed these people up. So there are hundreds of publications that now have come out of Loma Linda. And there's a variety of factors. They don't smoke as much as the rest of the American public. So that's obviously great. They have a little bit more average fitness than the average American public. That's great. They on average eat more plant foods than the average American public. That's great. And one of the things often attributed to their culture and diet is they eat significantly more nuts and seeds than the average American. And there seems to be pretty good data. Again, it's always if you're going to eat pork rinds and you're reaching for a bowl of raw walnuts, there's no doubt you've upgraded your snack. You still you know, need to watch the calories and uh, ask how much of that bowl of walnuts you're eating. But um, you know, it's an upgrade. Um, whether there's directly fiber and minerals and anti-cancer factors in nuts and seeds uh, isn't completely clear. But they are whole foods and they are good choices compared to so many of the others. So uh, the Adventist health studies have... Uh, provided a foundation that's really consistent. That's the most important thing. It's consistent with other data. It supports what's been done at the Harvard School of Public Health and their large databases, uh, studies of Okinawan diet and their results on health and longevity. So it's that beautiful consistency that allows us to say we know what the healthiest food plate looks like. And that's been published by the Harvard School of Public Health in 2011. It's a good example. You said it's not controversial, the idea to limit the amount of saturated fat you consume. Every major medical society endorses the idea, including the American Heart Association, the World Health Institute of Medicine, the European Society of Atherosclerosis, the Australian Society of Health. All these tell you 10% or less saturated fat. Some say as little as you could possibly get. Please elaborate on this. 
yeah, you know, reasonable people would like to advise the public and public health policy uh, of strategies to minimize their individual risk of having a heart attack, having a stroke, maybe developing cancer. And uh, that all ramped up after World War II and President Eisenhower having a heart attack. And it really became a big focus and a necessary focus because still to this day, over 2,000 people a day in the United States alone will die of heart disease. Somebody every 40 seconds has a heart attack in the United States. Yes, we have better strategies to treat them when they're in the middle of their heart attack. My specialty is something I've done you know, thousands of times, but that's not the goal. The goal is prevention of the heart attack. And all these societies have looked at all the data beginning in the 50s until the present time and concluded that we have access to too much food. We have access to a lot of foods, very rich in saturated fat, like cheeses in the crust of the pizza, on the pizza, and in the salad next to the pizza, um, and baked goods that are very rich, perhaps in butter, um, very common source of saturated fat, and all animal foods like fish and pork and poultry and red meat. And as a public policy, minimizing those foods, but we have to eat, so replacing them with plant-based foods, as I always say, bean stew, not beef stew, uh, bean chili, not beef chili, simple little substitutions will dramatically lower the percentage of saturated fat in your diet. It's the reason the American Heart Association advisory in 2017 also said, limit your coconut oil and palm oil intake because they can even provide more saturated fat calories than a steak. So do both. Don't cook your steak in coconut oil and don't eat either of them. But uh, it, there's Little doubt that if the public would actually adhere to these guidelines, we'd see a fall off in the very development of heart disease, and then we wouldn't need these expensive and uh, painful technologies to deal with the emergency, to deal with the upstream. Avoid the disease, ounce of prevention, lower your saturated fat in your diet, is worth a pound of cure, which is bypass and stent. But they're not really cures, they're just ways to treat this bad disease. How did Finland in the 1970s go from having the highest heart attack rate in the world to dramatically lower? Uh, several scientists were very concerned about Finland. Finland was one of the countries that Dr. Ansel Keys selected to be involved in the seven country study, partly because their diet was very high in animal products, very high in calculated percentage calories from saturated fat. And the observations were that they were indeed having a high heart attack rate. So they were included in the seven country study when it launched in 1958 as one of the 16 sites. But within about a decade, it wasn't just a research project. It was an economic uh, force in the country that young people were dropping dead of heart attacks um, and they needed a response to it. So the government, particularly in a region of Finland that abuts Russia, uh, called North Karelia. This region got together a public policy headed up by a physician named P Puska Peska and came up with strategies. Can we hang signs in the post office that say don't smoke? Can we go talk to the sausage makers and have them mix some beans in the sausage meat so that they actually were producing a lower saturated fat food source, a very popular food in Finland? Can we get on the grocery store shelves and educate uh, the people that are making food decisions in the house to use margarines of vegetable oils instead of butter? And, and can we get people to eat a bit more fruit and vegetable during the day? This all was a planned and really very organized, high profile reach pre-internet using you know posters and schools and workplaces and churches and community groups. But it worked because there was a change in the lifestyle, in the diet, in the percentage of saturated fat. Nobody became to my knowledge, a vegan, but they did shift their diet towards a more plant, healthier approach. And the heart attack rate started falling quickly. In five years, heart attacks were 85% less frequent than when they launched the study. It was published and well known, uh, and it made such an impact in the country that the other regions of Finland said, hey, we want to be part of this too. We may not be as high a heart attack rate as East Finland, uh, but we want to participate. And as the whole country adopted these hygienic measures, public health measures, the whole country benefited quite dramatically. So it's a stunning example of the impact of education and lectures and public health 
on, uh, and the ability of people to actually change their habits, um, just guiding them to healthier food choices, it can actually work. It's very hopeful. You mentioned that the Journal of the American College of Nutrition said intake of fish was correlated positively with the increased risk of diabetes. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, people get really hot under the collar when you say anything that's not positive about fish. Uh, and again, there are people that live in coastal regions and fish has become a mainstay of their diet. Um, but in most of the United States, we have the option of what's going to be on our plate. We have grocery stores. We have you know 24 seven access to food. So now we can ask the question. It's not that there's my boat, there's my fishing line. That's the only way I'm going to eat today. It's I could eat tofu, fish, pork, steak, broccoli. I mean, what am I going to put on my plate? for enjoyment, what am I going to put on my plate for health? So fish is uh, something now that's an option. Um, and in general, from our lessons from the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, when you substitute fish for red meat and pork and poultry, um, you uh, have made a trade that may be a little bit better. You're exposing yourself to a little higher concentration of omega-3 fatty acid content of fish flesh. You're still getting cholesterol. You're still getting saturated fat. You're not getting any fiber. Unfortunately, you are getting exposure to some toxins that could include in the bigger fish, particularly mercury, but in all fish, some of the chemicals that are in the environment like PCBs and PFAS and DDT. Um, but nonetheless, that exchange of red meat for fish is probably a health upgrade, but is it really healthy? And as some studies looked at the issue of intake of fish in questionnaires and population and the development of type 2 diabetes, there was a relationship. Higher fish intake, higher diabetes intake. There's the same relationship for red meat. Higher red meat intake, higher rate of diabetes, certainly for processed red meat. Higher bacon intake, higher rate of diabetes. Uh, it's probably characteristic of the fact that all those foods have a higher fat content, a higher saturated fat content, that we believe that those foods uh, will raise blood lipid levels, cholesterol, triglyceride levels, those fats will get into the tissues, muscles, and liver. They'll create insulin resistance, and we're on our way to developing diabetes. Not the only thing that leads us to develop diabetes, but uh, one of them is certainly, you know, uh, refined flours and added sugars um, and uh, uh, excess alcohol and all can all lead to weight gain and insulin resistance and development of diabetes. But it appears from epidemiologic studies and our understanding of why this might be true, that fish may actually promote the development of type 2 diabetes. So um, we're still you know, in the medical community, very happy to recommend the Mediterranean diet, eat fish, not red meat, but optimally um, limit your fish. Uh, Dr. Walter Longo from the University of Southern California and a world recognized longevity expert who doesn't really define himself by any food group, he's just a scientist, say, you know, two times a week maximum might be a reasonable intake of fish. Uh, I, for years and years, have avoided any. And none of the studies that have actually shown the reversal of heart disease, like Dr. Ornish's study, included fish. So um, I don't promote my patients eat fish unless they tell me I'm eating something and uh, that will be, you know, they're going out to dinner choice. Uh, but I still would advise them to keep that very infrequent. Can you sum up everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? Sure. The overwhelming 35,000 foot view of the nutrition world as dirty and contentious and as many food wars have occurred and such leads to one very clear conclusion. At least half your plate should be fruit and vegetables. A quarter should be legumes, beans, peas, lentils. We should drink water, tea, or black coffee, and we should have a source of protein that's as concentrated in the plant world as you'll tolerate, from edamame to beans to nuts to seeds, uh, that will increase your chance of avoiding disease and decrease your chance of developing uh, these non-communicable chronic diseases. What's the one thing I need to do today? The one thing you need to do today is cut back on animal foods and eat an apple. What is it about the real truth about health conference that you wanted to come back and speak? This is just a great platform of really esteemed lecturers, uh, really headline lecturers that have done the research, that have written the books, that have talked to the community, 
and to be amongst that group to both reach the live audience here and the international audience through uh, the mediums that, that we have is just so exciting and so important. So it's a great, great platform. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? I'm all over the internet uh, and all the social media channels, but I have a website, drjoelkahn.com, D-R-J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. And everything I do from my medical practice to my books to my restaurant and other things can all be found there.